I'm Todd Shrupp. Welcome to TVG's Legends. Tonight, we are going to turn the tables on Gary Stevens. As you recall, he's done a lot of interviews for us on Legends, but we turned it around with Jerry Bailey, who he sat down to interview, and then we asked Bailey to interview Stevens in return. When you look at the accomplishments of Gary Stevens, it really ties into how young he was and what he was able to reach in this sport. For example, he went into Racing's Hall of Fame at just the age of 34. He had victories just around 4,900, but three of the most important victories in his career were the Kentucky Derby. Jerry Bailey sits down with Gary Stevens. Gary, how did you get started in racing? Oh. A lot like you. Uh, I was raised around horses, actually. My mother was a, a barrel racer, uh, competed, and uh, had an uncle that was a jockey, just match races and stuff when I was a kid. But um, I didn't really have a, a passion for horses. I, I rode because horses were there. But uh, I, I guess I fell in love uh, with race horses when I was 11 years old, and I galloped. Uh, my first racehorse for my father. Who was that horse that inspired you so much? Horse named, uh, oh, Golden Ribbon. Horse named Golden Ribbon. I'm sorry, it, it took me a second there because I never forget that horse's name. He was, he was my cigar. Speaking of your brother, I, I was an only uh, boy in my family, and so I didn't have a brother, much less a jockey. How was that growing up with Scott, and, and what kind of interaction influence did he have with you? Had a huge influence. Both of my brothers did, actually. Uh, we. We were all involved in, in sports, and I was the youngest of three. And I always felt like I needed to prove myself uh, to my father. When Scott started racing, um, I said, how sweet is this? He's, he's making money. He's got girls around him all the time. And I said, that's what I, I want to do. And he actually was my biggest fan and the best coach that I ever had. Now, I understand that, that you are no different and that you went to great lengths to reassure yourself how good you were. And were there labels? I, I heard from Scott that you made labels in your room. Explain this to us, would you? <laughs> well, <laughs> I don't know where this comes from. But uh, yeah, I, I would get bored at night and practice uh, my, my writing on my bed, actually, on, on the headboard. I think it was something like you have to confirm with Scott, but I think I used to write Gary is great, something like that at, at a very young age. I think hoping that one day Gary would be great. Growing up small, just like you did, I always had this, this stigma to overcome, shrimp, you know, little peewee. Um, you had that as well, but you had something else to overcome, a disease with your hip. Parthes? Perthes. Perthes. Yeah. Explain that to us. It's, uh, uh, you, you either get Perthes disease in the knee joint or the hip joint, and it, what it's caused from is a lack of blood supply in that joint, and uh, the ball, of, of that hip joint actually starts to die and is dying because of the lack of blood supply and it's one of the only few bones in your body that will regenerate so that bone dies grows back but uh, I was placed in a full length uh, leg brace for 18 months while that process was happening and while that was going on I was I was called names uh, little kids can be very very uh, tough on other little kids and I was no exception, and it turned me into a fighter and in more ways than one, not only with the fist, but uh, in wanting to achieve certain things. Do you think that helped you later on in life? Uh, it, it definitely helped me later on in life. I knew that uh, I could overcome anything that I wanted to overcome and that I could achieve anything that I wanted to achieve if I worked hard enough. As I known you for all these years, um, I really never knew how closely our lives paralleled each other in, in a lot of aspects, not just, you know, from the gate to the finish, but outside too. Is it really true that you too wanted to be a football player? Oh, yeah. Um, I'll never forget the Thanksgiving day uh, after dinner, football games out in the snow, and uh, my brother Craig was, uh, Bart Starr was his idol. Scott, uh, his idol was Broadway Joe Willie Namath, and uh, uh, licking his fingers, and I was Joe Cap uh, for the Minnesota, Minnesota Vikings. Vikings. Yeah, sure. And uh, yeah, I wanted to, wanted to play football in the worst way. Oh, that, that's my era. Bart Starr was my idol. I remember Joe Cap playing in the snow. When Legends returns. I felt like I had been interfered with, and I knew I was going to win whether the photo said I won or whether they disqualified real quiet. And being in New York and a triple crown on the line, 
Uh, I couldn't imagine what that crowd was going to do. Most jockeys, when they become a jockey, dream of winning one race, and it's the Kentucky Derby. Was that the same with you, or do you, do you have another race in mind? No, I, I grew up uh, with quarter horses. I, I really, I, I would watch the Kentucky Derby on TV, but the big event for us with quarter horses was the All-American Fraternity. And all of our idols, Scott and I both, were uh, the quarter horse jockeys. How did you transcend from quarter horses into the thoroughbreds? Was it easy? Was it good that you had the quarters? Tell us about it. Well, to me, riding, uh, riding the quarter horses was every bit as difficult as, as riding thoroughbreds, if not more so. Riding thoroughbreds was slow. Everything was in slow motion. When you're going 350 yards on a quarter horse, things happen so very quickly. And, and when I began riding thoroughbreds, everything was just in slow motion. I saw things happening that uh, just were very easy for me. Gary, you, you learned your trade in Idaho. How did you decide to go to California, and how did that transpire? Uh, it was such a long process. Uh, in uh, 1980, uh, wrestling season was over. I was uh, a wrestler also. And uh, Taylor Powell, who used to be one of the representatives for the Jockeys Guild, he lived in Boise. And he had set me up with uh, a great trainer named Chuck Telefero. My brother had been offered that, that same sort of uh, scenario when he was 16 years old. And my parents didn't allow him to come to Southern California. And I'll never forget Scott sitting down with my mom and dad and asking them to give me permission to come to Southern California and, and don't take this uh, opportunity away from me. And, and they did. They let me come. And here I was, a 17-year-old kid. I'd just turned 17, coming from Boise, Idaho to Los Angeles. And, uh, uh, I was all by myself. I was staying in a Motel 6 on the back stretch of uh, Santa Anita, which is still there on Colorado Boulevard. And I couldn't win a race for anything. Um, I think I'd run 22 seconds before I finally won a race, and I had become very, very homesick. Uh, my dad said, you cannot come home until you win a race. Well, I happened to win three races on one day. And I had my car packed up so quick that you wouldn't believe. And I, I drove straight through from Los Angeles to Boise, Idaho. And I was able to uh, go home and ride a lot of races uh, that year, practicing the things that uh, I'd learned from Shoemaker, Pinkai, McCarr, Toro, uh, some of the greatest names that, that there's ever been. And um, it took me four years to make it back to Southern California. Tell me about how special Winning Colors is to you. You know, uh, probably the greatest thing that, that ever happened in my career, I mean, took me to the different level. I think that uh, I'd ridden in a, a Kentucky Der two Kentucky Derbies leading up to that. And um, until you win the big one, until the owners and the trainers know that they can put you in that grade one race on national TV and you're not going to fold, that you can handle the pressure, that's when you move to a different level. And that filly uh, gave me the confidence that, that I could do that. It wasn't Gary Stevens giving winning colors confidence. She gave me that confidence. You know, riding in that race with you, you know, a lot of people say, yeah, he went to the lead and just kept on going. But when you go to the lead on a horse, the biggest decision you have to make is when you're going to pull the trigger, when you're going to ask that horse to put the other f horses away. I felt like the, the 3 8 pole might be a bit early to be moving uh, in the Kentucky Derby, and I especially feel that now. And it's winning colors showing the way as they straighten away in the lane. Winning we colors. We got lucky and held on by a neck, but it happened to be the decisive move because no one thought the Philly was going to get a mile and a quarter. And Pat Day was sitting back on, on 49er. And had I let him get into the race from the 3 8 pole to the quarter pole, I'm, I'm very sure that 49er would have not just beat me, would have beat me easy. It's a fighting finish, winning colors by a hit. Tell me about your other derby wins. Oh, well, Thunder Gulch. I'd ridden Thunder Gulch when he was a two-year-old in the Remsen Stakes, and I never got back on board him until the Kentucky Derby. My good friend Mike Smith had been riding him in all the prep races. I was racing in Hong Kong at the time. They needed a rider for Thunder Gulch, and Ron Anderson was there with me. I didn't want to go. I, I didn't want to go ride him. 
Uh, I said he's a playboy, he leans on horses, he ran a bad race in the, in the bluegrass, so on and so forth. Wayne called like five times. And I said, no, I'm not going. I've made this trip five times uh, across the Pacific and, and I don't want to do it again. Mike Smith called me up and he said, Gary, I don't know why this horse ran like he did in the bluegrass, but if he runs back to the Fountain of Youth, uh, Florida Derby, blah, 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 he's good enough to win this thing. You should come and ride him. And they're off. I walked out of that paddock thinking there was no way I could get beat. And the way the horse warmed up, uh, he gave me that feeling. Um, he just did everything right in the post break. Gave me all the right signals and walked up to that gate like he owned the United States. And I had no doubt in my mind when I walked in the gate that I was gonna win it. But it's Thunder Gulch winning the Derby. Silver Charm, uh, 1997. Horse that, uh, my favorite of all time. Probably not the best horse that I ever rode, but uh, definitely my favorite. Uh, I felt like he was an overachiever. Um, he would do anything he could, find a way to win, uh, no matter what. Kind of like Gary Stevens. <laughs> it, I'll tell you what, he, he would have, uh, these gray hairs that I have and the lack of hair that I have, had I known early on riding him that he was gonna find a way to win, uh, I wouldn't have, sweated out some, some close photos. I, I would have taken it easy on myself the last quarter of a mile and waited until about the last 10 strides before I really bellied down on him because he would just sort of make a game out of it. It's Silver Charm at the 16th pole. Free house to the inside. Captain Budget is running after Silver Charm. Here's the line. It'll be close, and it is Silver Charm. This game is so filled with highs and lows. I mean, one day up, one moment up, the next moment down, from race to race. Talk to me about your feelings with Silver Charm and the Triple Crown. I mean, you won the Derby, you won the Preakness. How'd you feel going into the Belmont, and how'd the race go? I felt great going into the Belmont, and I feel the same now as I did then when I crossed the finish line. Um, I had the highest high I could ever have uh, passing uh, the 16th pole inside the last 100 yards. Um, it, it was a better feeling than any one of my Kentucky Derby wins. I thought Freehouse was, was the horse to beat that day. And when I pulled the trigger inside the 8th pole, I made the lead a lot quicker than I thought I was going to make the lead. Freehouse on the outside, and touch goal to third, and down the stretch they come. I thought we had the race won, and a lot of people have said, well, he didn't see the horse coming uh, that beat me. And it wasn't that I didn't see him. Silver Charm didn't feel him. Chris McCarron made probably as good a ride as I've ever seen that day. He knew that he had ridden Silver Charm. He knew what a battler he was, and he made his move like eight lengths out away from me. I saw his shadow coming five strides before he actually went past me, and I couldn't get Silver Charm running again. Touch gold on the outside! Touch gold puts a hand in front! 50 yards to go! Touch gold! Touch gold wins it by half a length, denying Silver Charm will finish second hit triple crown. So I went from this highest high uh, to the worst feeling that, that I've ever had in horse racing. It was the worst defeat that I've ever experienced. I felt like uh, we were bringing America a, a triple crown winner that day. So we were gonna make history. We'd already made history winning the, the Derby, but to win the triple crown, I don't know if it'll ever be done again. I really don't. So now you turn the tables and you're on victory gallop trying to deny Bob Baffert, who trained Silver Charm, his triple crown with Real Quiet. Tell me about that, Belmont. Nobody would have been rooting harder for Real Quiet had I been running third or fourth, knowing I had no chance of winning the race, um, I would have been rooting for Real Quiet to, to win it. But as soon as I knew at the 3 8 pole that I had a good chance of winning the race, um, that was my job. It's going to be very close. Here's the wire. It's too close to call. Was it Real Quiet or was it Victory Gallup? A picture is worth a thousand words. This photo is worth five million dollars. It was razor thin at the wire. Did you know you won? No, I didn't know I'd won. I was praying that I won, though. Um, 
just for the fact that I felt like I had been interfered with. And I knew I was going to win whether the photo said I won or whether they disqualified real quiet. And being in New York and a triple crown on the line, uh, I couldn't imagine what that crowd was going to do. Um, I didn't want to have to face my good friend, uh, Mike Pagram. Uh, there was a huge bonus involved. I mean, there were, there were so many issues uh, to contend with if they disqualified that horse. So uh, I was so happy when the photo light came, on, uh, came off and they flashed my number up there just for the fact that I knew there wasn't going to be a riot at uh, Belmont Park. <laughs> Point Given is a kind of horse like other horses, Risen Star comes to mind, that, that really had the potential to win the Triple Crown, but one, weren't able to win one race or the other. Talk about the Derby. It's the one race he didn't get done. I think uh, Point Given's probably the best horse never to win a Triple Crown that should have. Uh, why he ran the way he did that day at, uh, at Churchill Downs, I, I don't know for sure, but the track was very hard and very fast that day and he had some issues with uh, a hind, hind hoof um, that I think that hard track didn't help him. He continued on the rest of the year racing on deep, deeper eastern racetracks that uh, he had no problems with whatsoever. I, I squeezed him out of the gate which was a mistake looking back on it now but that's what you do in the Kentucky Derby. I, I've made two other mistakes after riding him in the Kentucky Derby where I didn't squeeze my horse to get position and I found myself in trouble and we just went way too fast but um, I know if I hadn't squeezed him leaving there I was going to be 25 lengths out of it and, and wouldn't have got any run out of him at all. Biggest disappointment in racing? Um, Silver Charm, not winning, the, not winning the Triple Crown. Biggest thrill and why? Silver Charm, <laughs> winning my third Kentucky Derby. The, the third one was the, the sweetest of all. Um, I loved the first one, the second one was better. I learned how to enjoy it a little bit and the third one, uh, I enjoyed it to its fullest. Favorite Breeders' Cup win? I'm going to have to say War Champ because I'd just come back off of my retirement. I'd actually only been back riding uh, for a couple of months. And one of the reasons I came back to ride as early as I did was Neil Drysdale uh, had come to me and told me he had a pretty special colt that uh, was headed for the Breeders' Cup mile. And he thought I was the right type of rider to, to ride him. And uh, to come back and only be racing competitively for two months. And War Champ is flying as they come to the finish. Here's the winner. War Champ. War Champ coming from 13th in this field. The final eighth of a mile that he ran that day was as brilliant of uh, last eighth of a mile as any turf horse that I'd ever ridden. So that was a huge thrill for me. All, all over the world there were a race here or there that you participate in. But you had extended stays uh, outside the United States. Explain that to us. I was never afraid to go anywhere, really, and I enjoyed traveling. But in 1995, when I went to Hong Kong, uh, that offer to go there and ride under contract couldn't have come at a better time in my life. I was going through a really difficult time, going through a divorce with four kids. Uh, my youngest daughter was two years old, and uh, I was at a crossroads. I, I wasn't doing well. I, I didn't feel like I was riding near to my capabilities and there was a lot of pressure on me uh, to earn money. It gave me a whole fresh outlook of how good things are here in the United States and how fortunate I had been in my career. England, you spent time in, in, in England riding. How'd you like that? I got an offer to uh, go to work for what I consider one of the greatest trainers uh, in the world and that's Sir Michael Stout and to ride for the Queen and Lord Weinstock and uh, Cheveley Park Stud, uh, some of the most uh, Judmont farms, uh, some of the most famous owners uh, with the best horses in the world and again a learning experience for me. I went in 1999, I fully expected to stay there. I'd been there for about five months and received a phone call from Prince Ahmed Salman's uh, Thoroughbred Corporation. They wanted me to come back here and, and ride under contract and um, with the horses they had at the time and with 
what they were offering me for my future. It was too good a deal to turn down. But I will say that one of my biggest regrets is uh, leaving England in 1999 in the situation I was in. Retirements. I can't remember the years, but I remember the feelings and what I was thinking. Gary Stevens retired. I thought, great. I don't have to chase him around anymore. I don't have to try and beat him. Maybe I can get some more good mounts. Tell me about your retirements and what precipitated them and why you chose to come back. The first retirement uh, in, and there's only going to be two, okay. by the way. Uh, the first retirement at the end of 1999, I was sort of forced into. It's something that uh, was an insurance issue that I, I can't talk about. Uh, there was a settlement that happened. Basically, I was left without uh, my own insurance, disability insurance. Those matters were resolved. I didn't want to quit at the time. I felt like I had a lot of good years left. Uh, when I made the, the decision to quit in 2005, it was for good. Uh, I'd fought my knee pain for long enough. Uh, I had the bad spill at Arlington Park in 2003 on storming home. Uh, I feared for my life that day on the racetrack. And I thought to myself, I've had a great, great career. Why do I want to push the envelope? Um, this doesn't make sense. Uh, it's going to happen. It, there's going to be other falls, and especially the way I rode. I did everything according to how you're supposed to do it. If it, something opens up on the rail, you go for it. When I made that decision in, in 2005, that was that. How are you feeling today? I feel great. I'm uh, out playing golf uh, three, four times a week, not in a lot of pain. I promised myself that I wouldn't get on a horse for 12 months after I quit riding. I do miss uh, the mornings. I miss exercising horses. When I saw you doing the special for the Dubai World Cup, uh, I was envious because you were still able to get on horses. Acting. Give me, a, give me a feel for what it was like to play George Wolf, a guy that you and I walked by his statue many, many times at Santa Anita. He's a legend in both our minds. How was that? It was strange for me because to be asked to uh, portray George Wolf, who I'd become a fan of his over the, the years. I spent a lot of time at the Derby restaurant, which he owned back in the thir 30s, and still a lot of his memorabilia there. I actually held his apprenticeship certificate uh, 15 years ago before I ever knew that uh, there was going to be this movie or anything else. So um, I felt like and still do feel like I've got a little bit of uh, George Wolf with me all the time. There's supposedly a, a ghost at the uh, uh, at the Derby restaurant, and uh, maybe he's with me a little bit of the time, maybe not. Uh, I'll just say that when when that film was over with, and as great a time as I had, and with the success that the film had, uh, when I had the fall at um, Arlington Park in 2003, when I was laying on that racetrack, the one thing that went through my head is with George Wolf dying at, at Santa Anita, um, I thought, this is a little too close for home for me to play him in the movie, and now here I am dying on the racetrack. And that really did go through my head. And uh, I was just glad to, that that's where the, the similarities ended. I experienced many a racing fan's dream by having the opportunity to truly get to know Gary Stevens as he worked at TVG for two years. And for all that Gary had in dealing with the public, he was always very kind, signed many autographs. The fiery side of his competitive personality would occasionally come out. One moment I remember very clearly is when we were up at Bay Meadows covering the El Camino Real Derby. A gentleman came up and said, Gary, you cost me a lot of money in the pick six on Breeders' Cup Day when you won on War Chant in the Net Jet Smile. Gary said, how so? The gentleman said, I had the second place finisher. If that horse had won, it would have been a life-changing score for me. You can understand what I'm saying, right? Gary Stevens kind of turned around and said, well, actually, it was a life-changing score for me and my family. Gary Stevens, a true competitor on and off the racetrack. Thanks for watching Legends.